Well, good morning. So thankful that you are here this morning. So grateful to come and have the opportunity to worship together. So grateful to have the opportunity to open up Scripture. And, and I know that Eber said it earlier, and as did Pastor Tim, but let me just uh, reiterate, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. I hope that you had a fantastic week. Listen, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, it was a fantastic week for me, okay? Uh, we got to have the opportunity to go see uh, my wife's side of the family, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, and we got to spend time with them. We got to eat some good food. But listen, the Aggies won and the Cowboys won. Okay, this is a, this is a red letter week, all right? This is, this is the best. Listen, listen, it has been a, if you're an Aggie fan or a Cowboys fan, it's been a rough year. Uh, shoot, it's been a rough lifetime for me, okay? So, so let me have this one, y'all. Y'all celebrate. It's been a great week. I, I'm on cloud nine this morning. I get to come. We get to preach. We get to, get to worship together, and you get to do it on the heels of an Aggie win and a Cowboy win. Come on, that's awesome. So, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. No, grateful to be with you guys this morning. So glad that you are here. And as, as Pastor Tim said earlier, uh, my name is Garrett Sims. If we've never had the opportunity to meet, uh, I'm on staff here in the student ministry department and um, only been here about seven months, actually. And my, I, have a, I have a wife. We've been married uh, for seven years. We've been together for a long time. We've got two little kids, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And listen, we are so grateful at all that God is doing uh, here at Bear Creek. We're so grateful to be a part. My whole family, we love getting to serve alongside each of you here at Bear Creek. And so I am grateful, if I haven't told you this morning, I'm grateful to be here worshiping with you. And I'm grateful that you have come to worship with us. Worship has been incredible this morning already. God has so much more in store for us. But I hope that we never get tired of starting out a service with baptism. Come on, that's, that's incredible. It's amazing that we get to come and we're part of a church. Yeah, we can clap for that. Come on, we are a part of a church that God is doing some incredible things. People's lives are being changed for eternity, right? One of my favorite songs, too, is, as, as Eber and the, and the band led earlier, is, is that song, How Good Is He? One of my favorite lines in any worship song is that line at the end of that song when he says, How good is he if he never did another thing for me? He's all I'll ever need. Man, how powerful, how, what truth. So a lot of times we equate God and his goodness with blessings, with material things, with positive things. But listen, if God never did another thing for me, he's still good because he's all I'll ever need. What an amazing morning of worship it has been. And if you've been here any of the past six or seven weeks, you know that our, our pastor, our senior pastor, Pastor David, has been leading us through a series titled Becoming. Becoming, and the whole idea of this series is, is that becoming is the most important thing. Becoming is the most important thing. Becoming all that God has created you to be. Becoming a reflection of our loving creator to represent and reflect him to the world that so desperately needs to experience him. Listen, this decision affects our entire life, right? Becoming better husbands and fathers, becoming better wives and mothers, better children, better siblings, better employees, becoming better in all areas of our life because God is moving and working within us. Becoming is the most important thing. And I love the whole premise for this series is that becoming is way better than achieving, Becoming is way better than achieving because, listen, the world will tell you that you're, you're going to have to work some things out on your own. You're going to have to fix, you're going to have to pick up, pull up your big boy pants and you're going to have to uh, fix things in your life and, and life is dependent on what you can do and what you can achieve and, and it's all about um, you have to achieve certain things or act certain ways. And listen, there are some practical things that we can do, okay? We can become better teachers and we can become better communicators or better listeners and, and my wife said amen to that one and we can become uh, better, better leaders, right? There are practical things that we can do to become better in areas of our life. But the truth of the matter is becoming is not about achieving, okay? Becoming is not about achieving. It's about abiding. Becoming is not about anything that you or I can do in our lives. It's about abiding in the presence of God. 
It's about desiring him to be more like him and allowing him to move in our hearts and lives. When we allow him to come into our lives, he begins, the Bible says he begins to change us from the inside out. As we spend time with him, as we abide in his presence, as we pursue him, he begins to change us. And we begin to display these nine heart qualities that we've been going through the last six or seven weeks. Okay, Paul writes about this in the book of Galatians. You can turn with me there. That's where we'll, we'll begin our service this morning. The book of Galatians is the passage that we have centered and themed this entire series around. Many of you may have heard this passage before. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. And the idea behind this is that as God moves in our lives, he begins to cultivate these fruit in our lives. He begins to cultivate these nine heart qualities that begin to display in our lives. And so this is what Paul says in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. He says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and I've got to stop there real quick because I want you to understand, he's contrasting this with what he said two verses before this, or three verses in the verse 19, when he says, but the works of the flesh are, and he begins listing out all of these works of the flesh, and the, and the, the contrast there is between works versus fruit. Works are something that you do. Fruit is something that's born inside of you. It's cultivated inside of you. Right? And so he's contrasting here. He says, but the, 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 the works of the flesh are, are lust and envy and jealousy and all of these other things. And he says, but, in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Do you see what Paul's saying there? He says if we live by the Spirit and we walk by the Spirit, the Spirit works in our lives and begins to produce this fruit. We begin to produce love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. These, these are the things that begin to put, be put on display through our lives because we abide with Christ and he begins to dis, uh, cultivate this fruit in our lives. And so we've gone through numbers one through six, we've covered love and joy and peace. Pastor David has covered all of those. Today, we're gonna be focusing in on numbers seven and eight. Specifically, that's faithfulness and gentleness. What does that look like in our lives as the Spirit cultivates that? Faithfulness and gentleness. The Greek word uh, used here for faithfulness is the Greek word pistes. It's the, it, it can mean a couple of things. We see it all over the New Testament. And it actually, if you have a King James version of Scripture, uh, the word there will actually be used as is faith. Because ultimately that's the root word of this. It's, it's, it's one of the definitions of this Greek word here. It's, it's this, the conviction, the belief that God exists and he's the creator of the world... And that Jesus is the Messiah and the way by which we obtain salvation. So specifically here, that word is referring to faith. It's the conviction, the belief that God exists, that he's the creator of the world, that Jesus is the Messiah, and it is the way by which we obtain salvation. And so, so what Paul's saying here is, listen, is to live a life full of faith. I remember being in, in, in sixth grade, I had to take, uh, I had to take uh, Latin, and, and they, they taught you, you know, the root word, and the prefixes, and the suffixes, and how it kind of changes the word, and, and, and how it adds to the word, and what it means, right? Well, as I was studying this, my, my attention, my memory was jogged to remember that sixth grade class and, and taking Latin, and so shout out to my teacher, uh, Mrs. Duckworth, all the work that you did, it, it, it does help. I, teachers, be encouraged, because it does help. Here I am, uh, 15 years later. And I'm remembering Latin class in sixth grade. And, I, and the root of this word faithfulness is faith. That's the Greek word that they use there, faith. Believing in Christ that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is the Messiah. Right? But that, that suffix that's added to that full, that suffix, it tells us something. It says that we should live a life full of faith. Not just in the areas where we're comfortable. Not just in the areas where we have abundance, right? It's easy to give when we have an abundance of resources. It's easy to serve when you're single and you don't have no kids. You know what I mean? It's easy to serve when you've got a lot of time on your hands. 
But the question is, is our life full of faith in all areas? Even the areas where it's difficult. That, that term faith is trusting God. Trusting God with your finances. Trusting God with your children as parents. Trusting God with your health or your job. Right? And so all areas of our life, we live a life full of faith. And as we trust God and we have faith in God and we believe in God and we put our trust in him, then that's shown in our faithfulness toward him. So, hey, God, we trust you with our finances, so now I'm faithful in my giving. So that's the other definition here that we see for this Greek word pistis, right? The first definition is it means faith. It means belief and conviction that God is the creator and Jesus is the Messiah. But the second definition of equal importance and relevance to this passage is this. The character, the character of one who can be relied upon. Now what a definition for God. That God is faithful. That God can be relied upon. And so notice what it says there. Because we trust God, we then in turn are faithful towards God. Because we trust him with our finances, we faithfully give. Because we trust him with our schedule and our time and our job, we faithfully serve. We faithfully attend. Paul is saying that that this fruit that's being cultivated in our lives is not only to live a life full of faith, but then from that point we show that faithfulness towards God. And that faithfulness is a direct message. When people see your faithfulness, come on, it's a direct message to a world that is looking for something to believe in. When they see your faithfulness, it sends a message to the world that's looking for something to believe in. Do you know that one of the greatest assets that you have to declaring God's goodness in our lives and leading people closer to Jesus is your testimony? Do you know that? What God has done and is doing in your life. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that that we will overcome the enemy in two ways. That we will overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb. That we can't control. God did that for us. God came to earth and he died and he shed his blood for you and me. The Bible says that we will overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb. Jesus took care of that. You know what the second part is? By the word of our testimony. Come on. That's how we literally overcome the enemy. By the death and the sacrifice and the resurrection and the spilled blood of Jesus Christ. And by you and me declaring with our lives what he's done in our life. It's the greatest asset that we have to declaring God's goodness and leading people closer to him is our testimony. So don't be ashamed of it. Don't be afraid of it. And so when people see your faithfulness, it leads them and it impacts them and it influences them closer to Jesus. We are called to be known by our faithfulness. So there's a few things I want you to take away from today. Number one is this. We are faithful... Because he has always been faithful. We are faithful because he has always been faithful. And let me tell you something, church. God, the uh, Bible says that God, at multiple times, that God and Jesus are faithful. That he'll never fail you. The Bible says that he will never leave you. Or forsake you. That his promises are true. And what he said he will do. He will accomplish. He won't fail. He's trustworthy. And he's loyal. And we can rely on him. That's what it means to be faithful. And that's the God we serve. That we can put our faith and our trust in him. And he won't fail you. And listen, I know some of us, we need to just start with that simple understanding this morning. Because I know for some people... Our only experience has been with imperfect people who have failed you at every turn. And so the only thing that you can equate faithfulness to is the people that let you down. The only experience that you have with faithfulness is faithlessness in people that fail you. And let me encourage you this morning that that, that, that's not the definition of God. The Bible says that he is faithful and he will not Fail you. Second Thessalonians says this, God is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. 
2 Timothy says this, even when, check this out, even when we are faithless, God is faithful. Oh, man, that's so powerful. Even when we are faithless, God is faithful. He never changes. He never fails. The Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that should bring some encouragement to you and me. Because I, I want you to hear something this morning. God's faithfulness is not dependent on you or me. Even when we fail, even when we let him down, even when we sin, even when we are faithless, God is still faithful because his faith is not dependent on your good deeds. His faith is not dependent on your obedience. His faith is not dependent on you or me. He's faithful all the time. Right? And so because as believers in Christ, we have experienced his faithfulness firsthand, it leads us to a, a higher calling. It leads us to say, okay, we've experienced the faithfulness of God. Now we are called to trust him with our whole lives. We are called to be faithful in our own lives. We are called to live lives full of faith. Listen, God is faithful. He's always been faithful, and he will always be faithful. And we seek to emulate that same faithfulness in our own lives and point people to him. So, so, so the first thing that I want you guys to understand and to take away from today is that we are faithful because he has always been faithful. And we've experienced that faithfulness firsthand, and it leads us to a higher calling. But secondly, and just as important as this, we are faithful in all things, regardless of the scope or the size. Listen, let me, let me, let me help you out with some truth today, that our faithfulness should not be dependent on a position or a possession or a person. Our faithfulness should be the same regardless of our situation or our circumstances, right? Because a lot of us will, will, will say, and it's easy to say, well, God, if you just give me more money, I'll be more faithful. <laughs> so y'all laughing. If you, if, you, if you just give me this position, then I'll be more faithful. If you open up my calendar a little bit more, I'll be more faithful. And God's saying, no, 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 I want you to be faithful now. If you're not faithful now, you won't be faithful later. Right? And so whether we're the CEO of the company or we're an entry-level worker, our faithfulness is the same. Whether we have 10 kids or zero kids, hey, listen, that's tough, that's tough. Whether we have 10 kids or zero kids, our faithfulness to God is the same. But here's the truth of the matter, right, is, is that the reality is uh, we want the spotlight. We want the corner office now. God, 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 we want the stage. Now, we want to be the face of the franchise. Now, I don't want to wait. God, I promise when you put me in that position, I will be faithful. But, but hear me this morning. Before we're ever ready for the palace, we must first be faithful in the pasture. Before we're ever ready to step into the palace and step into all that God has for us, you have to first be faithful in the pasture. And we see that in the story of David. You know that when Samuel came and he anointed David to be the next king of Israel, you know what David did? You know what he didn't do? He didn't get up and he'd go storm the gates of the palace and say, I'm taking over my throne and I'm taking what's rightfully mine and I'm going to sit here and I'm the next king of Israel and everybody needs to know it. No, you know what David did? He got up from his anointing and he walked back out to the pasture and he began tending sheep. He was faithful with wherever God had placed him. And he patiently waited, he patiently served with faithfulness until God placed him in the position that he had originally promised him. So listen, hear me, hear me, where, whatever, wherever, where, excuse me, <laughs> whether, <laughs> I get a little excited, you know what I mean? <laughs> whether we are picking up trash, whether we are setting up chairs, whether we are setting up for a children's event or serving in the student ministry, because Lord knows that is rough. Whether whatever we're doing or whether, we're our, whether we are preaching on the stage to thousands of people, we are to serve and to love with the same heart. Faithful in all things. You know why? Let me, let me, let me share this little tidbit of truth with you. Because ultimately, faithfulness is not something you do. Faithfulness is a position of your heart. 
It's how we can say uh, uh, my, my, the amount of money that I'm able to give may change, but my desire doesn't. My schedule may become a little bit more full, but my desire to serve your people doesn't change. It's how we can say that God, even though my situation and my circumstances may change, my desire to serve you, my faithfulness does not. Because it's a position of my heart. And it's not affected by outside circumstances. So listen, understand this. Uh, whether we are uh, in a big position, whether everybody knows our name or nobody knows us, we are called to be faithful and serve the exact same way. We actually see this, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We see this very concept illustrated. Jesus himself is talking and he's, and he's, and he's teaching his disciples and he, and he shares one of my favorite parables. He shares uh, the parable of the talents. And I'm just going to summarize it for you. We'll, we'll read in verse 19 here in just a moment. But what happens is this master comes and, and he says, I'm going to go on a trip. And so he calls three of his slaves, three of his servants, and he says, listen, I'm going to entrust you while I'm gone with my resources. I'm going to entrust you with my wealth. And what I want you to do is I want you to protect it and I want you to deliver it back to me when I come back, when I return. And so to one slave, he gives five talents, which back then a talent was a, a, um, a money, okay, it was an equal to a, a certain wealth. So he, to one slave, he gives five talents, to one slave, he gives two, and to one slave, he gets one. And if you know this story, maybe you don't, what happens is the guy with the five talents goes out and he invests the money, he's a good steward of it, and he's faithful with what his master has given him, and he doubles the money. He makes five more. The guy with the two talents does the exact same thing. He goes out, he's faithful, he's a good steward, and he invests the money, and he makes two more. The guy with the one talent, he was fearful. And he wanted to protect what he had been given. And so what he does is he goes out into the field, and he buries what he'd been given. He hides it. And so notice, then we we'll pick up in verse 19, when the master returns. This is what it says. Now, after a long time... The master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. And again, I told you, the guy with the two did the same thing. And so they both get the same response. This is so important. Notice the response. Verse 21. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful, there's our word, faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. But then when the, when the, and then the guy with the two comes and does the same thing, he says, hey, here's the two that you gave me, and here's two more. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in, in, in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. But the guy with one shows up and he says, listen, master, I know you to be a, a, a hard man. And I was, I, was, I was fearful that I would lose your money. So what I did was I hid it. And he gets reprimanded and he gets his talent taken away and given to the guy with ten. And here's the message in that that I want you to see today as we talk about faithfulness. Come on, listen. Every single one of us has been entrusted with something. Every single one of us has been entrusted with something. Maybe it's a gifting in your life. Maybe it's a talent, as we define talent in the English vocabulary. Maybe it's your influence. Maybe it's your personality or your financial resources. Or maybe you've been entrusted with, with time. Whatever it is, every single one of us has been entrusted with something. And, and here's, here's where people get caught up in that story, and I think it's important for us to talk about. Uh, it, not, it matters not how much you've been given. So we get caught up and we say, well, this guy got five and, and this guy got two and this guy got one. Well, listen, it doesn't matter how much you've been given. What matters is how faithful you were with what you were given. See, we spend our lives playing the comparison game and we're comparing ourselves to, the, well, if I just had the five talents, I could do so much more. Well, God, if you just given me the two, if you just given me this, if you just given me their bank account, if you just given me their circle of friends to their influence, well, God, I could do so much more. And God's saying, look, 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 I don't want you to compare yourself to them. Stop playing that game. Start being faithful with what I have entrusted you with. Because here's the deal. Here's the deal. At the end of the day, we don't answer to anybody else for what we've done. I don't answer to my mom. 
I don't answer to my dad. There's accountability on earth, and thank goodness for that. I don't answer to Pastor David or Pastor Tim. I don't answer to my wife. At the end of time, when I stand before God and he says, I gave you this to steward and to be faithful with and to work with, what did you do with it? I answer to him and him alone. And so instead of complaining and comparing ourselves, listen, can I just implore you and encourage you, whatever it is that you've been given, be faithful with that. And when you stand before God, we desire to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Listen, we're called to be faithful. We are called to be known as people who are faithful. And that is, doesn't change regardless of scope or size. And so we've seen our response, right? We've seen the faithfulness of God, that, that it, it is determined, uh, I'm sorry, that it's our response to God. God is faithful to us. Our response to him is to be faithful to him, to trust him. But if faithfulness is our response to God, then gentleness is our response to others. It's the manner in which we treat people. It's the manner in which we love people. The word there that he's used in Galatians 5 is, uh, the Greek word there is prautes. It means uh, a, a, a gentleness of spirit or meekness. Now a lot of times we read that word and we think that uh, it's being weak. Gentleness is, is being weak. Gentleness means that people are going to step all over you. People, gentleness means that people can walk all over you. Or, or maybe we read that and we think that gentleness is just being nice. Can I tell you something? Gentleness is not being weak, and it's not merely being nice. Gentleness is being humble. Gentleness is being humble. So the third thing I want us to realize as we transition over to gentleness here, the last two points, gentleness comes from the elimination of pride. Listen, the single most detrimental obstacle to fruit, any fruit, not just gentleness, love, joy, peace, patience, any of those fruit growing in your life, the single most detrimental obstacle to that is pride, is pride. Listen, I struggle. I struggle with this thing. Uh, <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of people that are like me. I struggle with this thing called, called forgetfulness. Um, and, and listen, I, I know some of you are like, you're only, you're only like 21. What do you mean you struggle with forgetfulness already? Okay, I'm a little bit older than that. But I know I'm young and I struggle with it already. Listen, I'm, I'm already preparing my wife. Listen, it only gets worse, okay? And, uh, and so I struggle with forgetfulness a lot. And it, it, it frustrates my wife to no end. Um, I tell her I'm working on it. I am. I am. But I struggle with this thing called forgetfulness. And I, and I see by your reaction that there's quite a few people in the audience who are like me, who struggle with the same issue. But listen, in our life, in our life, in our spiritual life, a lot of times we all tend to struggle from forgetfulness. Pride comes from this sense, this belief that we are more important than we actually are. Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I tell you something this morning? Can I burst your bubble in the most loving way possible? <laughs> Y'all already know what I'm about to say. You are not as important as you think you are. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I know you didn't come to church to hear that this morning, but I hope that you do hear that and you understand we are not, life is not about me. Life is not about you. It's about God. And pride comes from this misunderstanding that I'm a little bit more important than I think I am. And I suffer from forgetfulness that we are only who we are because of the grace of God. And so I begin to judge people or I put myself on a pedestal and I look at other people's situations and I judge their situations or their circumstances forgetting that I'm only here and where I am because God has forgiven me and he's shown me grace and mercy and love. Listen, the same God that died for you is the same God that died for the person that cut you off in traffic this morning on your way to church. <laughs> The same God that died for you is the same God that died for the person that was rude to you last week as you were going to shop for your last minute Thanksgiving supplies. Come on, I know how it goes. The same God that died for you died for the person that passionately disagrees with you on the topic of faith or is rude to you. And in fact, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You can look this up later. I'll read it to you real quick. But he begins to talking and he says uh, uh, there's all these, these sins of, of lust and envy and jealousy and anger and all this. And then he, and then he reminds the people of, of, Corinth, of Corinth and he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Such were some of you. Hey, hey don't forget, you used to struggle with anger. Hey, don't forget, you used to struggle with envy. You probably still do. 
Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Paul says, hey, don't forget, we were there once. And it's our job, it's our calling to be gentle with people that are there now. And so every time we see this word gentleness, it's used, it's used in, in reference to humility. It's, it's often used in conjunction with meekness or lowliness. That's who God has called us to be. Gentle, meek, lowly, humble. He's not called us to be a people characterized by pride or arrogance or conceit or smugness. The only way to uh, achieve gentleness is through the elimination of pride in our lives. Lastly is this. We're going to wrap up very quickly and uh, the band's going to come back out and, and we're going we're to close out today um, as we respond to what God is doing. But lastly, I want you to hear this. Gentleness extends from God through us. Bible says multiple times that God and Jesus are gentle. It, ex- it uses this word to describe them. And can I tell you something? The world experiences his gentleness through his people. The world experiences the gentleness of God through you. Through you. And before gentleness can ever be expressed, it has to be experienced. Turn with me over a few pages if you're still in Matthew 25 to Matthew chapter 11. And we see this very invitation being extended to the crowds from Jesus himself. Many of you have heard this passage, but it's Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus is saying, these are his words, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. There's our word. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the invitation for the crowds 2,000 years ago, and it's the invitation for you and me today. God is inviting you to be yoked to him. He's inviting you who's carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. He's inviting you who is suffering under the expectations of this world. He's inviting you who is collapsing under the weight of mental health struggle. You who feel like you can't go on any longer. God is inviting you today to find rest in him. To be yoked to him. To learn from him, to be gentle, to be um, humble, to learn, to find rest. Some of us, we need to begin there today. Just to experience God's gentleness. Before we can ever show it to somebody else, before we can ever express it, we have to experience it. And for the believers that are in here who have experienced God's gentleness, listen, it's our turn to allow that to grow in our lives and to show the world. So how do you react How do you react in traffic? How do you react on Black Friday when somebody went for the same TV that you were going for? You've been waiting all week for that thing. How do you react on Monday morning when you're late to work and they just told you your food's gonna be an extra five minutes? (laughs) How do we react? 2 Timothy chapter two says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. I'm gonna leave you with this and then we're gonna pray. The right message presented the wrong way becomes the wrong message. The right message presented the wrong way becomes the wrong message. You and I carry the greatest message in the world. We carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. But presented in the wrong way becomes the wrong message. So what are you reflecting today? What are you reflecting? What does your life say about the gentleness and the faithfulness of God. I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna have a time of response as they come and they sing once more. And then we'll, we'll dismiss here in just a moment. But let me pray for us as I wrap up today. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your gentleness that you invite us today to enter into your rest. Thank you, God, that you are faithful and because of that, we, are, we can be faithful. God, help us to live lives full of faith. Help us to trust you in all areas of our life. God, help us to reflect you well to a world that is hurting and lost and desiring to see and experience something new. Help us to walk through life and to live life with gentleness. God, we praise you today and we thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey everyone, my name is Lisa Lee and I'm the Director of Preschool Ministries at Bear Creek Church. 
Thank you for joining us for our broadcast today. This is so important. If you have placed your faith in Christ, or you're not sure you have, I want to invite you to take this incredibly important step today. If you want to know how, do this. Click on the link bearcreek.church backslash hope or text the word BC Hope to 84576. And in about two minutes, our pastor, David Welch, will walk you through how to place your faith in Christ as the leader of your life. Honestly, this could be the most important two minutes of your life. Lastly, let me invite you to join us at any Sunday in one of our four Sunday morning services. Check out our website, Bear Creek Church, to find out more about our times and locations. Again, thanks for joining our broadcast service.